the big data. John Archer pointed it out. We very often hear from people who analyze genome data that we are drowning in a flood of data. And so one of the challenges that we have is to learn to swim and to learn to breathe because this flood of data is not going to stop and there will never be a return to the time when we do not use computers. So we have to adjust it. There is a, there is a, a competition between the human brain and, uh, and the data that we have learned to produce. This is my team, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, this is very important. These are, uh, we have a very international team from Mexico, from India, from Portugal, from India, from Taiwan, and from Germany. And uh, you will see that they are all smiling and it's because we've actually had a, a very good year this year. So <laughs> we, we hope that we can keep that up. Uh, those, that's the team. Um, big data presents challenges and opportunities, but they, the data will not tell us by themselves what they mean. It's still up to the human element. We are still in control here in the world of humans versus big data because the data do not tell us anything. They do, the data do not contain meaning or, or insights. We have to ask questions. And in order to ask questions, we need to have theories that help structure the problem so that we can pose questions to the data. Now, without further justification, in the realm of early evolution, there is a theory. Can we please do the movie now? Um, about the origin of replicating systems, okay? So this is just, we talk about early microbial evolution, so it has a start. Every, there are different theories out there. Yes, you can continue, yeah. Yes, press the button, yeah, no, fine. Uh, by the way, it's important to say that this is just a theory and it's about the origin of life and all theories about the origin of life are unfalsifiable conjecture because even if we could make E. coli in a test tube, we still couldn't prove that our ancestors arose that way. It's just a theory. Late heavy bombardment at the bottom of the ocean, it was more protected, maybe cooler. There was no land for warm little ponds of the kind that Darwin had in mind. The black smokers were long considered as a possible source of the chemistry that gave rise to biochemistry. There's a different kind of hydrothermal vent here uh, shown in this slide that they're called alkaline hydrothermal vents or off-red vents or serpentinizing systems. They have a milder chemistry that's very interesting for telling a story about maybe how first cells could have evolved. Now, we're not talking about the black smokers because the black smokers, as you see here, reside right on top of magma chambers, and that water is much too hot for organic substances to be stable. 1200, magma is 1,200 degrees. The water that comes in contact with it is superheated and is therefore not a suitable system for uh, the ac accumulation of reduced carbon compounds. Circulation processes at the alkaline hydrothermal vents, the lost city type, are more suitable because the water coming out of the lost city vents is around 70 degrees and that's suitable for life. This is a very important process called serpentinization. It's very well known in geochemical systems and what it does is it gives rise to molecular hydrogen, H2, symbolized by the little white balls coming up. In essence, iron 2 uh, in the Earth's crust reduces water to give rise to that hydrogen. You've maybe heard of hydrogen economy. Hydrogen is a source of energy. Now the sulfur coming out of the geochemical systems interfaces with iron, the little black balls here to produce these iron sulfur precipitates at the hydrothermal mound. This is just a theory. The green atoms are nickel atoms that are very important in terms of catalysis. And what these iron sulfur uh, minerals do is perform catalysis. This is carbon dioxide, can be reduced to carbon monoxide. This is actually a cartoon of the enzymatic reaction mechanism of an enzyme called carbon monoxide dehydrogenase or CODH. Here is a methyl sulfide group reacting. We had to get some carbon-carbon bonds early on. This is one way to imagine it. 
carbonyl insertion, and that's a carbon-carbon bond. This uh, acetyl, nickel-bound acetyl group is removed in the enzymatic reaction me mechanism, and uh, laboratory simulations uh, showed that this will also work in the laboratory to generate this thing called acetyl methyl sulfide, which is a thioester. And if you're familiar with metabolism, you will know that thioesters of the type of acetyl-CoA are the most central compound in all of metabolism. We're suggesting that this is because metabolism arose that way as an idea. So you need compartmentation, and uh, this is also provided by these iron sulfur clusters. They can uh, uh, make uh, inorganic compartments within which we imagine something like an RNA world arising, spontaneous polymerization of nucleotides and amino acids to proteins. Uh, here we cheat very badly. This is the origin of the genetic code. We have no solution for the origin of genetic code, but every theory for the origin of life has to have it, so we just put it in there in the cartoon. And after all, it's a five-minute film, so we have to, you know, get to the point. Uh, now we have the origin of DNA, and then the emergence of two kinds of cells, two kinds of prokaryotes, the archaea and the bacteria that are very different, and they go on to populate the Earth, and it's... Uh, evolution as free living cells ever since. It's just one way to imagine it. It need not be true, and we could not, there is no way to prove that any of that is correct. So, can we go on to the, go back to my slide? Go back to my PDF presentation now? Yes, okay. So, we're clear, this is unfalsifiable conjecture. Okay, uh, now it's up to me, right? So, but is there any evidence in genomes for the nature of LUCA. Now, LUCA is a term that biologists or evolutionary biologists use to des designate the last universal common ancestor. In the film, that was some collection of molecules that lived, but not really lived, replicated within these hydrothermal uh, compartments at a hydrothermal vent. And uh, so is there any way that we can look at genomes and distill information that would somehow relate to these very early processes, okay? So in theory, it should be easy. We find the genes that are present in all forms of life, or it's easier just to look the ones that are shared by bacteria and archaea because the eukaryotes, the complex cells, arose later. We don't need to look for them early. And that should be Lucas genome. But uh, the devil is in the details, and like so many things, it's only easy in principle. And that's because lateral gene transfer, that we've already talked about today, John mentioned it, complicates prokaryotic evolution very much, especially the distribution of genes across genomes. And when I mention lateral gene transfer, we have to say that in prokaryotes, in the prokaryotic world, it is a well-known process. There are three mechanisms, conjugation via plasmids, uh, transduction via phage, or transformation, just uptake of naked DNA in the environment. And all three mechanisms are unidirectional, from donor to recipient, never reciprocal, and they just generate increasingly divergent copies of genes, and this is an unusual attribute in prokaryotic genomes. So, next slide. So this is, this is the problem as it re re uh, um, relates to and inferring ancestral genomes. This we call a gene over here, this little brown dot. That's a gene. Now, if it's present in these tips of this tree and absent over here, then we can confidently infer that it was present in this ancestor and probably arose somewhere along that branch because it's lacking over here. The pink dot is also easy. That was present in the universal ancestor and uh, it was lost over here in this branch. But patterns like this are more difficult. Here we have a gene that's present here and present once over here. Now, was it present in the common ancestor and lost three times over here, or was, did it arise here and was transferred over here? Because there are very many patterns in real data that look like this blue case, it's very difficult to infer what was present in the common ancestor because lateral gene transfer mimics a large LUCA genome. So, how to deal with this? Big data. We took uh, 2,000 
prokaryotic genomes, six million protein sequences uh, from 1,800 bacteria and 134 archaea, and we clustered them. What does clustering mean? Clustering means that we sort these proteins by all by all comparisons into families of natural sequence similarity. The process involves a BLAST comparison, and just to uh, m relate to the computer scientists, when we, when we do this, we have a 6 million by 6 million matrix. That's 36 trillion uh, data uh, uh, elements in the matrix, and this requires quite a large computer in order to read that file. So when we do that, we get 8,471 genes that have homologs in two arteria and two bacteria. And that uncovers the gene-sharing matrix between 134 archaea and about 1,800 bacteria. And what this pattern shows are the red, the red elements in the matrix, the red ticks in the matrix, 1,800 times 134, indicate um, where the genome pairs share 800 genes or more. And what you can see here is that there are many different uh, lineages of archaea that share lots of bacterial genes and some that share only a few bacterial genes. Now, are these bacterial genes that are not well distributed among the archaea, are those evidence for LUCA or are they lateral gene acquisitions. And that was the nature of, the, of, of this paper here, was to show that actually these red dots down here are lateral acquisitions. So we have 8,471 uh, uh, 8, alignments in trees. We make all the trees, we read them automatically with the computer to identify and remove the lateral gene transfers. So in 4,000 of the trees, the archaea were not monophyletic. That is definitely a lateral transfer. In the remaining trees, many of them are also lateral transfers, even though the archaea are monophyletic, and that's because we have distributions of the type present in 250 bacteria, but only two archaea. Those are recent transfers. The archaea acquired the gene and speciates, and that gives the monophyly pattern but clearly we cannot uh, uh, anticipate that the, uh, the last common ancestor had all the genes and there was only loss. So if we remove all these LGT cases, that gives us a list of 1,000 genes. Okay, we've gone from 8 million to 1,000. And if we remove those genes from the matrix, remember the old matrix looked like this, okay? And now we remove all the lateral transfers and it looks like this, okay? So we're pruning, and what we find is that there are some genome pairs here that contain more genes uh, in common than others. Now, I just tell you that these are aerobes, actinobacteria and sulfalobales. Those are oxygen-dependent organisms, and they can't be ancient because on the early Earth, there was no oxygen. Oxygen, we learned this morning, comes from cyanobacteria. These are mixed containing some anaerobes and some aerobes, and these are strict anaerobes over here. Clostridia and methanogens are basically the names of the genome pair. So if we read that, there are programs now that will read annotations and produce things called wordles. These are wordles, and this is one way. We'll probably be seeing more of this as data accumulates. It's reading large files and then saying, how often do these terms come up? And then it's a way of reading, uh, having a computer read a large amount of data and saying, what, what sounds am I hearing in that data? And we see two kinds here. We see in the anaerobes, clostridia, methanogens, methyltransferases, SAM, which is s adenosyl -meth methionine. Those are the main messages there. And then in the aerobes, we see sulfalobales, halobacteria, actinobacteria, and oxygen. Now, the oxygen part, the aerobes, can't be ancient. That means that we focus on these here. And so what we've done is that list here in the anaerobes is only 62 genes. We've gone from 6 million protein sequences to 8,000 families to 1,000 to 62. It's not very much. 
but they provide a first glimpse of Luca's lifestyle um, as estimated from genomes. So from big data, we obtained a small result. We asked the question, but now the important thing is, can we understand the answer? Can we, is there any meaning in this or not? Can we, can we relate to other individuals? Can, is, there, is this, are we, are we a, a victim of our own big data? Well, that's one way of looking at it. And if we transfer, translate these functions into this, which is a, a minimal metabolic map of the basic functions that we see, it's not alive. It's just a very basic backbone of acetyl-CoA biosynthesis here, okay, these acetyl groups, methyl groups, funny thing, we saw those in the movie, but the movie was made independent of this, uh, of this information. We see uh, methyl groups uh, taking an important role in, in basic metabolism. The synthesis of these acetyl thioesters, that was very surprising to see that. We see nitrogen accumulation. Okay, we have to incorporate nitrogen into metabolism. That's there in this list of 62. And we also see an antiporter here, uh, things that take sodium inside the cell and put it outside the cell while taking protons from outside the cell and putting them in and an ATPase that can harness these gradients, but there is no structure here. There's no cell wall and no membrane. Well, that's when our imagination comes in. If we add the hydrothermal vent, actually this makes a lot of sense because uh, there are formulations of this out there in the literature where we say at this ancient hydrothermal vent, some of the earliest proteins could maybe use this natural pH gradient, pH gradient at the hydrothermal vents, alkaline inside, acid outside in the ancient ocean, so that a proton gradient could be transduced into a sodium gradient that could be harnessed by these ancient ATPases. So that actually fits quite well. But we're not quite done yet because the other functions we see here are ferrodoxin, iron sulfur, flavidoxin, iron sulfur, electron bifurcation, an iron sulfur dependent process that we see among the anaerobes, flavoproteins, cobalt, nickel, and iron, metals. There is a lot to say about metals. And so this is sort of the, the final figure of what we see in this list of 62. It fits very well with the predictions generated from just an idea. That does not mean that it's true because there is no truth in genomes. It's just one way of thinking about it. And if we look at it in a particular subjective manner, this is the result that we can obtain. It's very interesting though to note the importance of these metals. And people might wonder why transition metals like iron, nickel, and cobalt are important in early chemistry. They are important in modern chemistry, in chemical industry, and the reason is, is that these transition metals have large, they're called D and F electron shells, where the orbitals can hybridize in such a way to generate metastable bonds with carbon and nitrogen. They are excellent catalysts. Okay, so geochemistry might provide a picture of Luca here that is not alive, it's only half alive. So, to summarize, big data can inform us about the nature of ancient life, but we have to ask very specific questions. Genomes depict the last universal common ancestor as only being partially alive, dependent upon chemicals and energy stemming from within the earth. We can think about how Luca might have lived and we can discuss it, but it's only uh, our imagination because this cannot be reenacted. There is no truth in genomes. They can perhaps help us better imagine early life and thus develop more detailed theories. But on the bottom line, there are no facts, only observations and their interpretation. And this is a process in which we're still involved today. So this is um, my group and my thank you slide where we obtain our funding. But most importantly, what I would like to say here is a word about what is life. Schrodinger had a very famous uh, book entitled, What is Life? Well, he talked about, you know, what is life? And scientists like to debate today, what is life, what is not, what is not life? Well, in a recent contribution, I was asked to de describe what is life, and I said, well, basically, life is short. That's what life is, <laughs> to, to, to hold on to the, to, the, to the basics. 
And the other thing is, is that this is my group, but these, these are my two young children here. They're now 12, 12 and, and 9, Lily and Honey, and that is life. And furthermore, I know exactly how it arose. So thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions.